Good morning. Yeah, welcome to PC Evangelical and Reformed Church. It's wonderful to see you on this beautiful fourth Sunday of July. I can't believe it's the fourth Sunday of July already, but it is. It's amazing. And we're here to worship God, and we pray that the Lord will give you something to chew on as we come before his throne and as we give him all the glory. And as we begin the service, we have some announcements to highlight. We have the quarterly meeting right after the service, about 10.05 this morning. Also, we have some birthdays in the Peace Church family. Today, Lily Bruckner turns two years old, and Becky Thiel has a birthday today. Tuesday, Tanner Hansen and Jamie Lurkey have birthdays. Friday, and on Friday, Chelsea Neal has a birthday. So happy birthday. Also, there's a couple of anniversaries. Well, actually, tomorrow, Tracy and Stephanie Bartle celebrate their wedding anniversary. So happy anniversary to Tracy and Stephanie. We also want to thank all the people who helped out at, at Betty Becker's funeral on Friday. We had the service here in the sanctuary, and, and many of you came out and helped. And we just want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all of your help. We also need to pray for Rick and Gina Keenest. Um, they had a motorcycle accident, and Gina was admitted to a Spokane, Washington hospital with a broken pelvis, ribs, and a punctured lung. So we need to remember Gina Keenest and Rick in our prayers this morning. Also, we want to thank all those who helped out at the bingo party in New Holstein on Thursday. We went to the nursing home and we ministered to the residents, and we almost everybody there won at bingo. We passed out prizes, and a good time was had by all. So thank you so much for your service and helping out. Do we have any other announcements to highlight? Yes, Tammy. Hey, thank you. So there's another week to get corrections in for the directory. Paula. Bus leaves at 8 tomorrow. Okay, the bus for the Ark Encounter leaves at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. And I was going to say something about this is your last chance to get on board the Ark while you still can, but <laughs> I'm told the registration time has passed. But we're, we're looking forward to that. That's going to be a, a fantastic time. We leave at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning from church, and we should be back Wednesday night around 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Jeannie. And it's okay to park in the parking lot. And it's okay to park in the parking lot. We'll let the sheriff's department know that there will be some people from church whose cars are going to be there for a couple of days. So, yeah, thanks for reminding me. Okay, and this concludes our morning announcement. Let's look to the Lord our God in prayer. God, we love you so much. We just want to thank you for your blessings, your presence, your compassion, and forgiveness through Christ. We dedicate the whole service to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Greet the person beside you and welcome them to Peace Church. Let's remain standing for our opening song, number three. I asked the dentist what time, what one time, what's your favorite hymn? He said, crown him with many crowns. So we'll sing number three. I know. <laughs> 
<laughs> Number three, let's crown him Lord of all. <laughs> That was good singing. We'll remain standing for the reciting of the Apostles' Creed, which is found in the back of the songbook on the right side and also on the screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And thank you. You may be seated. Yeah, Tammy. One more announcement? Yeah, sure thing. You can submit a picture into the directory, but it needs to be in by next week, right? Okay. The kids can come up. We'll have the children's message. Do we have any kids here today? I see one. I see two. Ah. Oh, good morning. Hey, good morning. Who knows what I got with me here? You know what this is? What is this, Lila? It's a, yes, you're right. This is a dustpan, and this is a broom. 
And when do people use these? Yeah, when they're cleaning, when there's a mess. And sometimes when we're at home, we can show our love and appreciation for our parents by helping out, right? And we could sweep, we could clean our rooms. I don't have to do too much today because our janitor does a really good job. <laughs> but this is one thing that we can do. What, what are some other things that you can do at home to show your love and appreciation for mom and dad? How many of you have beds, your own bed? Okay, one of you, two of you do, very good. Now, what could you, after you get out of bed in the morning, what could you do after you get out of bed to show love and appreciation for mom? What could you do with your bed? You don't want to leave your blankets and pillows all messed up. So what could you do to help out your mommy and your daddy? Yeah. That's right. You could make the bed and mom will say, I'm so proud of you. You did it all by yourself. And that's why we do good works as Christians, because we want to show our love and appreciation to God. We don't do it to earn our way to heaven, because Jesus did all the heavy lifting on the cross, right? But we do good works to demonstrate our love, just like you do at home, because you love your family. Let us pray. God, we thank you that we can show our love for mom and dad. They show our love, their love for us, by feeding us and clothing us and putting a roof over our heads. I guess the least that we can do is make our beds and do a little sweeping around the house. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> A few weeks ago, we were doing a nursing home service in Chilton, and Jeannie was with me. And after the service, one of the ladies said, is that your wife? And I said, yeah. And she said, she's a beautiful woman. And I said, well, I tell her that all the time. And she said, you better. <laughs> it was a, I, I do it all the time, but it was still a good reminder to hear that. You know, it's important. And I think that's the way I see a lot of the things in the book of James. It's a good reminder. It's good to be reminded that we are here, we are made for a mission, that we are redeemed for a reason. We are saved to serve. And that's what James wants to get through to us in James chapter two. James chapter two, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has, has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, and does nothing about his needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that said, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. You see that a man is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. This is the word of the Lord. 
and may the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the teaching of the Word of God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the scriptures, and I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations and thoughts of my heart would be pleasing to you and faithful to the scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. My dad was helping me pick out my very first car, and we saw an ad in the paper that said, 1981 Plymouth Reliant, looks new, $400. I like the ad, and I like the price. So we went and checked out the car in the man's garage, and it did look new. It had beautiful, lush, gorgeous, velvet red seats. I was excited. My first car. And then the owner said, well, let me pull it out of the garage. He tried to turn the key, and it didn't start. He tried again, and it didn't start. He took more than five minutes, and he couldn't get the car started. My dad said, we'll think about it. Thank you very much. <laughs> the car looked new, but it was so disappointing because it didn't work the way it should. The reliant wasn't very reliant. As we look at James chapter 2 today, I want you to be asking yourselves, am I working for God? Am I reaching out to others and ministering the love of Jesus to people like I should? Am I extending the mercy and grace and forgiveness of Christ to other people the way I should? Am I reliant? Am I demonstrating my faith by my actions? James goes on to address one of the issues that was a major conflict in the church. There were some people who were perverting the gospel of Paul and saying, you know, we don't have to do any work. You know, as long as we believe in God intellectually, we don't have to do any work because we're saved by grace through faith, right? So we shouldn't have to do any work at all. And James is saying, well, I got a problem here. I got to let these people know that true faith expresses itself in appreciative action. That's what it really looks like. So he says in verse 14, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Let's say there's a man who gets hired at Sargento working, making $18 an hour. He shows up the next morning, 6.30 a.m., first shift, and he sits down in his chair, he puts his feet up, and he cracks open a beer. Boss comes out and says, what do you think you're doing? This isn't Margaritaville. <laughs> Why aren't you doing the work you were hired to do? The person says, well, when I accepted this job offer, I put my faith and allegiance in you as my boss, and so all I have to do is believe in your ability to support me and give me a paycheck, and I don't have to do any work. Once hired, always hired. Well, what's going to happen to that person? Mr. Once hired, always hired is going to get fired because if he was truly appreciative and allegiant to the boss and to the company, he would express it by doing the work that he was called to do. But by not doing the work, he is demonstrating that his allegiance and appreciation for the company is false, a fraud. Just as false allegiance to a company is not going to save your job, false allegiance to Jesus Christ will not save your soul. Faith works. True faith expresses itself in daily action. And we see that all through the Bible. Luke chapter 19, Zacchaeus receives Christ into his home and into his heart as Lord and Savior, and he says, I'm going to pay back all the people that I ripped off. And in Acts chapter 4, Barnabas accepts Christ and he sells a field. He puts the money at the apostles' feet in appreciation for all that God has done for him. Acts chapter 6, the apostles appoint 
deacons to take care of Gentile widows to make sure that they are not overlooked in the distribution of food while they're out there preaching the gospel. Acts chapter 9, Paul receives Christ and immediately he demonstrates his faith by preaching in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Acts chapter 16, Lydia receives Christ and she says, if you consider me a believer, come to my house. And she opened her home and that became the home of the Philippian congregation. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13, Paul says to the Corinthians, I just want to thank you for giving to the Lord. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with everybody. So Paul and James, we're going to see, are in agreement that obedience goes hand in hand with true faith. And we see that in the history of the church. St. Augustine showed his love for Jesus Christ by writing a whole bunch of books to help Christians. John Wesley accepted Christ and showed his love and appreciation for God by starting schools and orphanages and churches and helping Christians everywhere. Dwight Moody showed his love and appreciation for Christ by starting a Sunday school and inviting all the kids who wanted to attend, even if they couldn't afford to pay the dues. And I see evidence of faith in action right here at PC Evangelical and Reformed Church. Some of you took a whole week off of work to help out at Vacation Bible School. Some of you took the day off to help out at Betty Becker's funeral on Friday. Some of you even took some time off, or are going to take time off to help out at the Gospel Fest. In your life, I see evidence that true faith works. And that's what makes what follows so ridiculous and kind of hard to understand. James chapter 2, verse 15, he says, Suppose a brother or sister is without clothing and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Let's say there's a little girl that comes to church. And let's say it's January. It's hard to imagine that right now on July 23rd. But it's January. And you look at her and you say, where is your coat? It's three degrees outside. And she says, I don't have one. And you go, oh, my heart hurts for you. Is it okay if I say a prayer for you? She says, I guess. And so you pray. Lord, I pray that somewhere, somehow, through someone, you would get this little girl a coat in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Then you send her out in the cold and say, I'll see you later. (laughs) Keep warm and well fed. What? What was that? That was not true compassion because if you had true compassion you wouldn't just offer her a prayer you'd find her a coat and mittens and a hat james is saying in the same way that true compassion is accompanied by acts of compassion true faith is accompanied by good deeds and acts of faith i love the story in matthew chapter 25 where above the sheep and the goats, where Son of Man returns in all His glory, and He's seated on His throne, and He puts the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. And He says to the sheep on His right, Come, you who are blessed of My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you helped me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And then the sheep will say, Well, Lord, when were you hungry, and we gave you something to eat? When were you thirsty, and we gave you something to drink? When were you a stranger, and we invited you in? When did you need clothes, and we clothed you? 
When were you in prison and what were you in for? And we helped you. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. You demonstrated your faith with works. But then, what does he say to the goats on his left? Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Why does he say that? Because I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me in. I needed clothes, and you didn't clothe me. I was sick. You didn't help me. I was in prison. You didn't visit me. And then the goats will say, well, we had faith. When were you hungry and we didn't give you something to eat? When were you thirsty and we didn't give you something to drink? If you want something now, we can get you something now. When did you need clothes and we didn't clothe you? Jesus will say, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for the least of these brothers of mine, you did not do for me. Depart from me. Which group are you in? Are you in the group that is demonstrating your faith by helping the hurting, the heartbroken, the homeless, and the homebound? Or are you in the other group where Jesus is going to say what you did not do for the least of these you did not do for me? Dr. James Merritt says, the presence of good works does not prove the presence of faith, but the absence of good works most definitely shows an absence of faith. What kind of a faith do you have? Do you have a defective faith that can't help anybody and won't help anybody? Or do you have a faith that works? James warns about not only a defective faith that doesn't work, he warns about a demonic faith that deceives. James 2, verse 18. Some people will argue, well, you know what? It's okay if I don't demonstrate my faith by my behavior. You have faith and I have deeds. You said earlier in James 1 verse 17 that we all have different gifts from God, so maybe your gift is faith, and that's fine. You don't need to do good works. My gift is good works. I don't need to, do, I don't need to have faith. And James is saying, give me a break. You show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. If you want, anybody could say that they have faith, but talk is cheap. I want to demonstrate to Almighty God that I truly love Him and that my faith in Him is real. I've read literally thousands of Christian books since becoming pastor of PC Evangelical and Reformed Church, but honestly, I've learned more about how Christianity works by watching many of you. We just had Betty Becker's funeral on Friday. Did you know that she taught Sunday school to preschool kids for 28 years right here in our church? She went through a lot of hard times in her life. She had a child die in a car accident when he was only three years old. She had another one with juvenile diabetes most of her life and endured multiple surgeries, but she never got weary. She never lost heart. She never turned her back on God and the church. Instead, she demonstrated her faith with her actions, and she held unswervingly to the hope of Jesus Christ. That's what true faith looks like. But James is laughing at some people who say, well, I believe in God. I have faith. I believe in the man upstairs. Listen to how he handles those people. James 2, verse 19. You believe that there is one God Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You say you believe in God? Well, that puts you on the same level as the devil. The devil believes in God, so what? When was the last time you'd seen a demon do something for God? Yeah, he says he believes. Not only that, this is kind of convicting. It says that even demons believe and they shudder. 
Sometimes in the Bible, demons show more fear of God than people do. You ever, you remember that story in Mark chapter 5 when Jesus comes up to that man who's possessed by all those demons and they go, Jesus, don't torture us before the time. It reminds me of that scene in a wrestling program when a wrestler comes in the ring and the guy in the ring is scared because he sees that wrestler is full of motivation and power and he gets on his knees and goes, that's what a lot of the demons were doing when they saw Christ. They knew who he was. But they rebelled against God. They turned away from God. James is concerned that sometimes Christians act more like demons than disciples. He doesn't want that to happen. Well, you say, well, well Pastor Mark, what does true uh, well, what does true faith look like? Verse 20, you foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that said Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. You see that a man is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. You say, all right, I get it. We, by, by doing what God wants us to do, we demonstrate that our faith is real and not a fraud. I get it. There was an article recently in a Southern California newspaper, and the headline really bothered me. It said, many people in Orange County don't practice their faith. It asked the people, do you believe in God? And they all said yes. But then they asked a bunch of follow-up questions. Do you donate your time? No. Do you give to your church? No. Do you share your faith? No. Do you read the Bible? No. James would say that is a false faith. That is not faith at all. Somebody who doesn't show the fruit in their lives is fooling themselves. And they need to repent and turn to God. Well, you say, well, Pastor Mark, isn't what you just read here a contradiction? James says a man's justified by what he does and not by faith alone. And Paul says in Romans 3.28, we maintain that a man is, is justified by faith apart from what he does. That sounds like a contradiction. Which is it? Are we saved by faith or saved by works? Well, Mark Driscoll shares a very helpful illustration that might help us out today. He says, let's say you're at the doctor's office, and he's got two rooms. He goes into one room, and you hear him say to the patient, you need to be more active. You need to work. You need to jog. You need to exercise. And then he goes to the other room where there's a patient and he says you need to stop working so hard you need to sit down you need to take it easy you need to get some rest is that a contradiction no oh, that's two different patients first patient is very heavy second patient has a broken leg once you understand that you got two different patients with two different diagnoses then you understand why the advice sounds a little bit different. That's what the situation is here. Paul's patients are different from James's patients. Paul's patients are worried because they think that there's some relig religious ritual they have to do to earn eternal life. They're worried. They're freaking out. Am I going to hell? Am I going to lose my salvation? Do I have to get baptized, Judaized? Do I got to take communion? Paul says, no. Jesus paid it all. All to him, to him we owe. Well, do I have to get circumcised? Jewish people had to do that. Is that going to help me? No, not really. Probably not. You just need to trust in Christ. Is that all? Yeah, that's all. Man's justified by faith apart from observing the law. These people needed to understand that 
Jesus did all the heavy lifting on the cross of Calvary, and they needed to trust in his finished work before they could think about what they could do to show their love and appreciation for God. James's patients know that already, and they're not serving God, so that's why James says, don't just sit there. Do something. Get to work. Paul shows us how to be saved, James shows us what it looks like to be saved. Paul is talking about how to know you're saved. James is talking about how to show you're saved. Paul is addressing the problem of legalism. James is expressing the problem of laziness. Two different patients, two different situations. God ministering to each and every one depending on the person. The important thing is that we're living it. I heard a story about a boy who came to church and he was watching his younger brother get baptized. And after the service, he cried in the car all the way home. And dad said, well, what's wrong? He wouldn't say anything. Finally, he got home, still crying. The dad says, you got to tell me why are you upset? And the boy said, well, that priest said that he wanted us brought up in a Christian home, and I wanted to stay here with you guys. <laughs> That's hard. <laughs> he had trouble seeing true faith in his parents. What does your Christianity look like to your kids? Are you putting your faith into practice? Are you not only telling them about Christ, but showing them Christ by how you care for others? James says, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. How many of you need to trade in your phony faith for real faith? How many of you realize, you know what? I, all this time, I've believed in God in my head, but I haven't demonstrated it with my actions. I need to get involved in some kind of ministry. Maybe God is speaking to one of you today. Maybe God is leading you to show your faith in Christ by helping out with Sunday school. Or So many of you have done that already. I saw a whole bunch of people signing up for Gospel Fest right before the service began. You want to demonstrate your faith by your deeds. It's one of the things I love about our church so much. But maybe God is speaking to somebody else who hasn't yet made a commitment to get involved in a ministry. And I want to invite you to Christ because he loves you and cares enough to give you the real truth. Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen. Let's remain seated and we'll sing our song of commitment. Number 469, verse 1, verse 2, verse 5. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus.
to trust and obey. Sweet, sit at his feet. Do we have any prayer requests to add to the list this morning?